Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. Every week I feature a new unconventionalist who has ditched their desk in order to chase their passions around the world. Every Monday we talk about their epic travel adventures. Every Wednesday we continue the conversation and figure out just how they're able to make these travels happen from a financial standpoint. Every Friday, I do a solo episode where I talk about my own entrepreneurial journey so that you can learn from my successes and failures. And I also discuss my own travels. If you would like to be a part of a community of like-minded, travel-loving, adventure-seeking people, you can join us in the Living Unconventionally Facebook community by going to livingunconventionally.com forward slash Facebook. I hope this podcast and that community will help you get started on your own freedom journey so that one day I can be featuring you and your world travels. Welcome to episode 141. If you have not noticed, I did not have a solo episode last week, and that is because my microphone that I am currently using is dying on me. (laughs) It keeps disconnecting from my computer in the middle of recordings, and I actually had to cancel multiple interviews last week as a result of this, and it is taking me several tries to record these little, you know, one and two minute intros. It's taking me so long, but I wanted to make sure I still had some episodes for you this week, so I am just sucking it up and recording these quick little bits for the intros and outros for this week while I wait on my new microphone to come in the mail, but I did just want to offer that real quick explanation for why there was no Friday solo episode last week. Now, if you're part of the Living Unconventionally Facebook community, you already know about all of this because they are always kept in the loop with everything that's going on. They are the first people to know and sometimes the only people to know what is happening. So I recommend that you join that group if you're not a part of it already. Now, because I had to cancel those interviews last week, I actually am going to switch things up a bit this week and we're going to do something a little bit different. And we're going to go with some interviews that I already had recorded before my microphone really started to give me fits. And so today we are going to have actually kind of a check-in interview with a guest who was previously on the show, and that is Del Hambleton. She was actually our guest in episodes 34 and 35, so over 100 episodes ago. And those episodes actually came out about 10 months ago, so we are kind of coming up on the one-year mark. And I've decided to start checking back in with some of my guests from the beginning of the show just to see what's happening and figure out, you know, how their life has changed in this past year. So in today's episode with Dell, we are going to talk about the documentary that she was actually in the process of getting ready to make in which she was going to travel the Trail of Tears water route in reverse in order to connect with her Native American heritage. At the time, Dell was just months away from getting started on that journey, but as life has a way of doing, it completely changed for her when she learned about what was happening at Standing Rock. She felt compelled to participate at first as a journalist and then going back a second time as part of the volunteer medical team. So we're going to talk about her experiences at Standing Rock today, and they are unbelievably powerful. And then we're also going to, of course, find out how her documentary is coming along and this trip that she is now about to embark upon as soon as it gets warm. And we're going to hear how she's dealt with the trials and tribulations because she has had some major setbacks along the way. And this is something that everyone who lives unconventionally experiences. And she has an amazing story of how she's been able to overcome situations that would knock most people down for good. So let's not waste any more time and go ahead and dive right on in with Dell. Well, Del, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I am so excited to catch up with you and hear about what you've been up to since you were last on the show almost a year ago. Not quite, but but pretty close. And just hear how your unconventional life has taken some unexpected turns. So if you don't mind just kind of uh, touching base on what it is that you're doing right at the moment. Sure. And before we get started, I just wanted to say thanks. You're doing such an amazing job, Brittany. And um, I've really enjoyed listening to podcasts that you've done with so many other people. They really inspired me and helped keep me on 
on my path. But so when I need to be inspired, I listen to your podcast. Oh, thanks. Thanks. That, oh, that always makes me like, so makes my heart so happy whenever I hear people say that. Yeah. You're part of my tribe and you interview and do podcasts with my tribe. And sometimes this lifestyle feels very lonely. Mm -hmm. So since we talked last a number of things have have happened. Just to recap, I was uh, preparing to embark on the walking the Cherokee Trail of Tears water route in reverse, and then paddling it in a sea kayak from Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, back to the Arkansas Oklahoma border across five rivers. And part of that journey was. Uh, building my own boat. And I'd planned to build it from scratch, but I found a pygmy uh, 17 and a half foot sea kayak that uh, someone was selling that they'd started building, but lost interest in. So I bought that for a really good price and was uh, helped by an amazing mentor, uh, an amazing uh, boat building mentor. And he helped me cut hatches and basically finish the boat out. It was beautiful, just beautiful. I was living in Portland at the time. And then it came to actually getting ready to do this thing, whatever it was going to look like. And you know, the way I travel is pretty... I plan it to a certain extent, but then I try to to follow spiritual suggestions that I feel come my way. And I started having some really disturbing dreams just really quickly. Do you, do you want me to t explain my dream? Yeah, yeah, sure. So in my dream, I was standing in a stone house surrounded by a small group of people that I recognized as my people. Some were my family, some were my close friends, but they were my people. And there was something happening on the outside that was very disturbing. And the floor of the stone house started to slowly sink. And we were deciding whether to just, um, because it was safe in the stone house, and uh, we were deciding whether to stay there and see what if this floor would stop moving and then see what happened next or thinking that the floor would not stop moving we had a very short window of time to get out the windows and and get out of the house which we didn't really like because we liked to be in the stone house it was very it was very safe mm -hmm. um we all decided to get out and dive through the windows and we found ourselves out on this open plain with this war going on and we promised to stay together and to protect one another and then the dream would end i had this dream for three nights in a row and it was one of those big dreams mm -hmm. where it's clear that this this was important and then a, about a week later after those the three consecutive dreams um, I started hearing about Standing Rock mm -hmm. and what was going on on the reservation with the Dakota Access Pipeline being rammed through the tribal treaty lands of the Standing Rock Sioux there. And I was really disturbed by it. But, you know, take into consideration that I'd never heard of Standing Rock before, and I'm not your normal protester or an environmental protester. I've never been an environmental protester. I've never protested anything, really. I've been a journalist. I've been an observer. And I had this big trip that I was planning. You mm -hmm. know? <laughs> One that you had been working very hard, you know, to get, get going for a while. Yeah, four years. So it just became really clear to me that I was, I needed to go to North Dakota because number one, I, you know, as a reporter, as a journalist, I wanted to see for myself what was going on mm -hmm. because social media can obscure the truth so easily. Um, and I didn't know who to believe and who not to believe. And so I ended up going to Standing Rock twice, actually. The first time I went, I went as a volunteer. I volunteered my services as a journalist with the Standing Rock no dapple media team. So I would cover the actions. You know, I'm, I met Amy Goodman. I met Jill Stein. I'm, you know, there are a lot of people that came just to 
Amy Goodman was amazing. Uh, are you familiar with her? No, actually, I'm not. Amy Goodman is a journalist, and she she's an amazing journalist that works for Democracy Now. And we were out covering one of the actions side by side when the Dapple Security company released the attack dogs into the crowd. Mm. I was right by dogs that were attacking people, and Amy Goodman was there with her cameraman, and she, you know she was covering it. It was very disturbing. So for that part, I can say Standing Rock is real. It is real. And the issues there are real. But I will also say that I learned a great deal about myself in that situation as a journalist and really examined closely what I stood for and how I wanted my voice to be used and for what purposes. Because it's 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 very important how we use our voice and how it's uh, echoed out into the world. So I came back uh, to Oregon, um, pretty broken up, actually. <laughs> right. Now, how long were you there for that first time? Uh, a little over a month. Okay. And I went back a second time as a volunteer with the Standing Rock Medic and Healer Council. And for the most part, I was a medic transport. So uh, when people um, were hurt, I would take them from the field, actually, and back to um, one of the medic areas for to be cared for. So that was Standing Rock. And I've been back from Standing Rock now for several weeks and refocusing on my on my going to water journey and getting healthy. <laughs> Everybody that goes to Standing Rock gets sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm back now and refocusing on my trail of tears um, going to water journey. Okay. And so, I mean, obviously you and I know that we have kept up on Facebook. We have mm -hmm. remained friends and I have checked in on your posts ever since I had you on the show the first time. So I saw your preparations for the documentary and the trials and tribulations you had with that. You know, there were quite mm -hmm. a few. And mm -hmm. then I saw you go through Standing Rock and I mean, your your updates and your posts on that were very important for me as someone who was not able to be there. You know, I, I could trust your voice and your opinion and, and your journalistic integrity to state the facts, but also your moral compass to, you know, know what was right and wrong. So it was very much appreciated that you were a voice for the people at Standing Rock. Thank you. I, I mean, I kind of just want to talk about it a little bit. I obviously don't want to dominate the interview with it, but mm -hmm. I mean, as a journalist, as someone who, you know, is just there to observe and report the facts and be unbiased. How do you feel that Standing Rock was portrayed on social media, you know, on television? Do you think it's accurate or do you think they're not quite showing the full story or do you think it's being blown out of proportion? What's your perspective on that? Uh, well, first I would have to say that, um, that I went back to see for myself what was happening. And so I won't go so far as to say that I went back with the idea of remaining unbiased because I don't think that that's possible mm -hmm. at Standing Rock. Once you see the brutality and the um, the Orwellian misuse of information that law enforcement was using across the board, really, um, county, state, and federal, and the company itself, it is impossible to stay unbiased because very, very quickly, once you could understand the history of the people in the Dakotas and specifically the Standing Rock Sioux tribe, actually the uh, Ochete Sakawan, the seven tribes, and not just the Standing Rock, but their experience or historical experience with colonialization and, mm -hmm. and what that's done, what that means. You know, there's a, there was a lot of, of history that I learned and just bald racism and violence. And to see law enforcement that we, when I was a little girl, I was taught to respect an, law enforcement and that we could trust them. If we needed something, that, that that's what law enforcement officers were for. We could go to them for assistance. That's not the way it is in North Dakota. It's dangerous in North Dakota, particularly if you're Native American and particularly if you're a female Native American. 
So I wasn't unbiased. I'll, I'll just honestly say that. Secondly, there was a complete mainstream media blackout for weeks and weeks and weeks, Brittany. This situation was so outrageously out of hand for so long mm -hmm. that it took nationally recognized figures like Amy Goodman to be on the ground to say, this is happening. And if you look at democracynow.org, all of this, the Standing Rock episodes that Amy and her team have done are there. So I encourage people to, to you can, uh, Democracy Now! is a news uh, platform that can be trusted, as is um, The Guardian. The Guardian has done a series of absolutely hard-hitting and accurate journalistic storytelling. Um, I met amazing journalists and photojournalists and videographers that really have put themselves in harm's way to get the story out to the world. And they've been arrested. A friend of mine, Jenny Monet, was just arrested, I believe on, I'm sorry, it was just a few days ago. She's done an, a number of things for PBS. She is an amazing journalistic storyteller and was arrested and charged with inciting a riot and trespassing as a, as a professional journalist. So, um, no, I do not believe that the national news media has told the world accurately what's going on at Standing Rock. And I believe it's because of where the money comes to keep mm -hmm. them on the air. <laughs> Right, right. And I have zero doubts about that, which is why, even though social media can be a negative thing, it's where I turned for, mm -hmm. you know, the videos yeah. and yeah. the stories from the people actually there on the ground at Standing Rock. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. So now that you're back, how, you know, how do you let that kind of change who you are, but also not stop you from, you know, going forward with the plans you had prior to mm -hmm. Standing Rock, especially now, you know, that we have a particular person in office who's bound and determined to help make everything go through, you know, mm -hmm. how do you move forward? Well, you know, I pray and then I wait to listen for guidance. I know that sounds very esoteric, but, you know, <laughs> that seems to be my the strategy that works the best. And coming away from Standing Rock, I realize very wise people have pointed out that Standing Rock didn't just happen. And this last election cycle and the, the individual that was, that was elected, and that didn't just happen. The environment had to be present mm -hmm. uh, for that series of events to transpire. And if we want something different for our world, then we need to each individually commit to creating a different world. And that doesn't, doesn't mean sitting around holding hands and singing kumbaya. It means that depending on how much risk tolerance each of us has, you know, we move our money from banks that are supporting projects like the Dakota Access Pipeline. We go way upstream with the politics and we get involved with our community on a political level and and we engage. We help create changes in our community or there are parts of all of our communities that work just wonderfully and we just need to be involved and meet and support others and develop relationships and develop healthier relationships with ourselves, you know, those kind of things are what are going to change our world. Learning why we're so compelled, compulsory consumption, and what fast fashion is all about. What What is that? And how do we extract ourselves from it? So there are a lot of little pieces of being personally involved to create a healthier world. Sitting around bitching and complaining, that may be the, like the first step. You know, we sit around and we have a beer and we bitch and complain. <laughs> but then, you know, then it's time to stand up and be accountable. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, so many people are Facebook activists or social media activists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the second they step away from their computer, 
they go about their normal lives. And this is something that I, you know, I do struggle with. I used to be a lot more politically involved. I was involved with both of uh, President Obama's campaigns and was actively, you know, campaigning for him. And Mm -hmm. it's so easy for us to get wrapped up in our own lives and the daily, you know, problems that we think we have to deal with, the fires we have to put out that we just can ignore everything else. And I think your your message of becoming involved and becoming active is important because even if it's something as simple as knocking on a couple of doors and just talking to people or, you know, walking in a march like the women's march that we just had Mm -hmm. and just doing those small little things that really may take one day of your time, a few hours of your time. But if everyone does that, it can make a big, big impact. Mm -hmm. I agree. There was one more thing that I wanted to touch on that we kind of discussed for this this episode, and that is, you know, when we plan a, a big change in our lives, and we and we think that we are going to go learn something, or we're going to go do something, or we we have this focus of what it is that that's going to look like, right? Mm-hmm. And all we can do is pull together the resources and talk to the people that we think can help us through these journeys. But ultimately, what we have in our minds and are projecting forward as far as what this journey is going to look like, we have to keep in mind that a journey is a very sacred thing. And along a journey, we ourselves are fundamentally changed. And we don't know what that's going to look like. But the universe, I won't go so far as to say the universe does or God does or the creator does, but we have asked for a certain lesson and in learning that lesson and going through the process of learning that lesson, there's, there's certain situations and dynamics and, and struggles and dilemmas that we must necessarily face to learn who we are in the face of them, how we're going to respond during those challenges and We have no idea what we're going to look like coming out the other side. So instead, this has changed. This one very important aspect of going to water has changed. And that is that I had this really clear, clearly delineated idea of where I was going to go and how I was going to navigate the Trail of Tears water route in reverse, right? Very Mm -hmm. geographically geographically. And now, uh, though that pathway is still my intended trajectory, I am interested in developing relationships and and meeting real people. I just want to see where the universe has to take me, where God has to take me, and who I interact with. And I'm not going to rush through those, those experiences. I'm going to be just be with them. And that's a very simplistic way of explaining, I guess, that relationships and, and I don't mean just with people either, my relationship with myself, my relationship with my environment, my relationship with the world around me, Mm -hmm. all of that is so crucial for me on this journey. And that's really a fundamental shift in my going to water journey. Right. And I love that. And I actually was recently on another travel podcast and the host and I were talking about just the way that we travel. We like to plan enough things that, you know, we are going to be okay while we're in a location. We we generally know what's going to sure. happen. Mm-hmm. But every time you make a hard set plan, you're shutting off so many other opportunities. That's you so know, you're true, limiting right? yourself and boxing yourself in. And so I think this new way of approaching your going to water journey is amazing because you are allowing yourself to, yes, have a plan to stick to if that's how it happens at the time, but also to leave yourself open to the amazing opportunities that are bound to come, you know, while you're on this incredible journey. Absolutely. Now, one thing I want to mention, and it it kind of relates to that there, especially facing adversity, I know that you ran into a lot of 
hiccups, we'll call them, Mm -hmm. while you were getting set out the first time around, you know, before Standing Rock and before all of that, you know, kind of changed your path at that time. Uh, One of which, if I remember correctly, someone broke into your truck and stole the money that you had for the trip. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I was was so devastated for you and I was (laughs) so impressed by how you did not let that keep you, you know, down for long. Obviously, it was devastating and I can't imagine what you went through. But I mean, here you are and you're still moving forward. And so I think that's Mm -hmm. incredible. Do you mind just talking about how you dealt with that kind of a major setback? Sure. Well, I was down in California, actually visiting my daughter and my grandchildren. And we had taken, uh, we had taken the kids to a state park and Anna had had a fairly new baby and hadn't really gotten out of the house. So we went down to the state park and took the kids to the river so they could play. And while we were at the river, someone smashed the window in her van, actually, and stole her purse and all the money. I just sold my car. If you remember Clementine, right, my car, yeah. mm-hmm. I just sold my car and had that cash because I hadn't had a chance to put it, actually put it in the bank yet and stole that. But miraculously left my camera and really expensive camera lenses right next to it. It Mm -hmm. But so that was kind of a blessing. Right. But that was pretty devastating. And I felt extremely violated and I was depressed and angry for a few days. Mm -hmm. But then I realized Now, this is also going to sound very esoteric, but the world is so abundant. And I really did. This sounds so trite, but it's true. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. I got to the point where I really I'm not sure about forgiveness because that's like a huge it's a huge, Mm -hmm. very complex subject. But I wished the person or people that stole the money, that took the money that in some way that led to a series of events in which they would get help. Now, I don't know if that ever happened, but that was my intention. And that's how I released my quote loss of the money, that it was a transaction, that it was an energetic transaction. And my intention for it was that that it would compel them to a a place in a situation where they would really get the help they needed because they evidently really needed help. Right. And I let it go. And I went back to Portland and I don't really want to talk about this a lot because I didn't know it was going to happen. And I'm not going to, I don't want to suggest that, oh, well, you know, you get, you know, money stolen from you and then this happens, you know, Mm -hmm. but my mom had passed away several years ago and she had left a piece of real estate to my brothers and I, and it happened that the house Um, was put up on the market and was sold. And each of us kids received that gifted part of the real estate sale. And so the loss of the money, what before, while it was like, this is, I I didn't have much more than that, right? Mm -hmm. Receiving the gift of my mother's property really did, it took away the stress of the financial part of the loss. So I can't really say, oh, and I struggled and I had to work three jobs to, you know, recapture the money. But I will tell you this, here's a little, here's a little kind of twist in that story. I loved my car, as you probably know, if you Mm -hmm. follow me on social media. (laughs) And when I received the money from the real estate transaction, my friend actually, um, we went to coffee and he just, he just, you know, he was trying to break it to me. I'd sold my car to Chevy. And it was that money that had been stolen. And Chevy said, you know, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and have to sell the car because I can't really, you know, I can't, I'm not really in a position to handle this. He just told me he said I was going to sell the car. And he said, I just wanted to tell you. Um, so you were prepared. <laughs> he knows how much I love Clementine. And he said, in, in maybe, you know, somebody that would like, that would be a good home for Clementine. And I said, you bet I do. (laughs) I want her back. So I bought Clementine back. It was part of the money from my mom's house. So Clementine's back home now with me. Right. Good. Good. (laughs) Well, one thing uh, about that whole story there and, you know, especially about receiving that, you know, unexpectedly the 
money from the sale of your mother's property. And one thing I've just noticed about your story in general, and I think it's because who you are and your energy that you put out into the universe, is that you seem to, and I don't want to say it's not a, a product of hard work or anything, but you seem to have a lot of kind of serendipitous events that happen. The people that come into your life at just the right mm -hmm. exact time, you know, people who help you in, you know, ways that you weren't even sure that you needed that, you know, just, just change things for you. Mm -hmm. And, and, and obviously, again, that is not because you're not doing the work. You absolutely are. But you're also just kind of putting it out into the universe that you're open to these things. And that, you know, I think when you are bound and determined to not let things get you down and not let things stop you, you're going to receive help in ways that you don't expect. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you, Brittany. And I think that there's one element, like, you know, you, you have certain ingredients that you need for, to make a loaf of bread, right? And you can try to make a loaf of bread if you don't, if it's not either sourdough, which I'm learning to make, by the way, <laughs> or yeast, right? Your loaf is not going to raise. There's nothing you can do to get that loaf to raise. And, and so there's certain really key ingredients, I believe, for a successful and satisfying life. I had to have some really loving and wise mentors teach me about gratitude and gratitude for the simplest things, you know, waking up and, and feeling yummy sheets on my legs, you know, um, drinking a, a wonderfully clean and delicious glass of water, watching the rain and knowing that it's, that it's, that it's feeding the earth rather than going the damn rain. I'm so mm -hmm. tired. Oh, you know, in Oregon, we're like, we've really <laughs> been inundated with rain and just to stay grateful about those very simple things and the big things. And then even further trying to find gratefulness for the lessons and the dynamics of the things that occur within our lives, like the theft of my money, that's really hard. And, and mm -hmm. I think it's important not to fake that. And I think it's important also to be authentic about disappointment and anger and frustration. And that's what Epsom salt baths are for. You know, <laughs> you know I go sit in the bath and go, God, this is a sucky day. Mm -hmm. But gratitude, Brittany, I, I believe gratitude and really learning self-love in order to learn to love others more than in just some trite, you know, romantic idea of, of love. But I really, really love people. That's what I figure I'm here for. And adding gratitude, if I'm really, really frustrated, if I can look around and really feel into my gratitude, I can turn a steamship that's, you know, that's headed for a, a waterfall. So real quick, just to wrap up here, I do want to figure out where going to water is at the moment. Mm. What is your time frame for this and, and how is that proceeding forward? Well, I'm going back to Maine in March, April to help my son and with my grandson. Uh, and then when I get back here, once it warms up, I have some people that are willing to come with me and be my road crew, which is great because I wanted, as you know, I wanted to walk. I didn't want to just drive, but... I plan to embark when it gets warm and, you know, go through Colorado. So I'd love to stop in and see you and start up at the headwaters of the Colorado and follow those down into Oklahoma, which is where my part of my lineage, my, my uh, ancestral lands are. And then go to Tahlequah and then start following the rivers back to Tennessee and North Carolina. So I'll just say when it's warm. <laughs> because after North Dakota, I've really had enough cold. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I cannot even imagine. It was, yeah, it's bad. It's cold. <laughs> okay. And so one final question here for this kind of, you know, check in almost one year later. Uh -huh. For the people who are planning a journey and running into those hiccups, those frustrations, those devastating moments where everything seems to be falling apart, what do you recommend for them to help get them able to push through and make it to whatever destination they're supposed to reach, you know, even if it's not the one they intended. Mm -hmm. My first suggestion or recommendation is to be still and pray and be clear about your questions. Be clear about what you're asking and look at hurdles and challenges as a gift 
to either slow you down or to get you to ask the right questions. Because good planning always comes down to asking the right questions and then figuring out the answers to those. So detours in the road, detours in a journey are a gift. Really looking at them as a gift, a humbling gift. And maybe that's what we need, you know? Maybe we need just to slow down and and be a lot more humble and less certain about where we're going. And that wraps up my interview with Del Hamilton. These check-in episodes are only going to be, you know, just one interview. There's no second part. But I hope that you were able to really let Del's story of her experiences at Standing Rock and with having several thousand dollars stolen from her that was supposed to go towards this very important journey and just her worldview and just how she lives her life in a way that allows her to appreciate everything and not get knocked down by these things that can be so devastating in the moment. I will have links to everything that Dell mentioned in today's episode in the show notes on my website, and you can find those at livingunconventionally.com forward slash 141. And of course, those are the actual numbers, 141. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, if you are not in the Living Unconventionally Facebook community, you should definitely join so that you can stay up to date on everything happening with Living Unconventionally and so that you can connect with the almost 500 community members that we have in there now who are sharing amazing travel stories and pictures and forming relationships and bonds. We actually have a member in the group right now, Farah, who has officially entered pre-tirement, as she calls it, and her and her husband have set out on their journey, and their first stop is Iceland, and they just arrived, and she's already sharing pictures. So again, if you would like to join that community, all you have to do is click the link that'll be in the show notes I just mentioned, or simply go to livingunconventionally.com forward slash Facebook. That is going to wrap it up for today's episode, but I want to invite you to come back on Wednesday, where we are going to have another community member spotlight. And so this means that I actually will be speaking with one of those nearly 500 members of that Living Unconventionally Facebook community. And we're going to check in and see the stories behind the people that are in this group. And this week is Mimi, and she has an amazing story of the five-week journey that she traveled across the deserts in Africa as part of a National Geographic documentary in which they literally starved her. Literally, like 300 calories a day, literally starved her. She had to fight off wild hyenas and swim through alligator-infested waters. So you definitely don't want to miss this episode. Mimi is amazing, and you're going to love her. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I will see you back here on Wednesday. Have a fantastic day. Bye.